the parents should be doing the opposite. They should be doing everything they can to encourage and facilitate an ongoing relationship with that other parent because both parents are so important. And especially young children, they look to each parent as their stability in life. And if, if dad's not around as, as much as he used to, they're going to start to wonder about their stability. They might start to become afraid. They might start to become anxious. As you pointed out, they might start uh, acting out. This is episode number 517 with AJ Grossman, how to communicate with the difficult ex. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Weiner. Welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. And to support you on your journey to lasting love, I wrote a book. It's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And it's filled with 30 chapters, each of them designed to help you step more fully into your value, whether you're single or in a relationship. And it's available on Amazon for Kindle or paperback. And every week I bring you a tip from the book. This week's tip is step number 18, which is dare to think big. I remember after my divorce and I got out into the world of dating and starting my own business and becoming a coach for the first time. And I had lived most of my life kind of being the supporting role for other people. And I was afraid to think really big. I kind of played under the radar. And daring to think big helps you to achieve dreams and goals that you never believed were possible. And so my challenge to you today is if there's anything that you're thinking small about, whether it's career or relationship or even a conversation that you are scared to have, I really encourage you to just do it, just try it because all the good stuff happens on the other side of that comfort zone. And now before I bring AJ on, I just wanted to uh, just let you know, if you're not already a member of my fabulous Facebook group called Your Last First Date, please join us over there. We are an amazing group of women, really moderated by incredible women. I have seven, wonderful moderators who keep this group along with me to keep it safe and sane and positive in in the growth and towards your last first date. So if you would like a place where you will be positively supported and not just allowed to vent and just go down a rabbit hole of a cesspool of complaints, join us at your last first date. And now for my fabulous guest today, AJ Grossman. He is an attorney. He's the son of a Navy officer and he's the founder of several businesses. He learned early on about being in service to other people. Being in the right place and doing the right thing for others is what drives him to continue growing his legal practice. And he focuses on providing solutions that protect the interests of those who seek amicable resolutions in their lives. And today we're gonna to be discussing about how to deal when it's not so amicable, how to deal with those difficult exes. And I think so many people can relate. So welcome to the show, AJ. Sandy, thank you so much for having me today. I feel so honored and blessed to be with you today. Oh, thank you. Well, let's start with a question that a lot of people have who are trying to co-parent with a really difficult ex. How can they do that? How can they really have a better co-parenting relationship? The way I view families and people who come to see me, my clients are, um, is, is that, that every person is a unique individual. Neither one of us, none of us have a, an exact clone of us out in the world. And so we're all unique. We're all made up of our, our life experiences, um, our childhood, positive experiences, negative experiences. And so every family is different because every parent is different. And one of the themes that I see a lot in the divorces that I've, I've handled is oftentimes one parent will try and enact too much control over the other parent for a variety of reasons. And <clears throat> I think that the best course to follow is to be mindful about your parenting, learn about your partner's parenting style, 
Talk about how your styles are similar. Try and find some common ground between the two of you. Also talk about how they're different and talk about why each of you believes that it's important to do certain things. I think if, if two co-parents can come together and have a, what I would call a learning conversation about their parenting style differences with the sincere interest to learn where that other parent is coming from, that will go a long way because too many times what I see is the typical fight or argument dance where the purpose seems to be um, communicating a message well, this is, this, is, this is why I do what I do, and I think it's important because, and then the other person says, well, I don't see it that way. I do it this way because blank, 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 blank. So if co-parents could approach each other and say something like, it's clear, I think you'll agree with me that we have a different perspective on how to parent our, our children. And really, at the end of the day, neither one of us is right or wrong. We just have different perspectives. And I want to learn more about where you're coming from. I think that those few steps could go a huge way, uh, take a step in a positive direction to help resolve that conflict. I love that. I, I think that this takes the power control, the power play out of, out of that relationship, which is where people get stuck in these endless arguments. My way is right. Your way is wrong, which is probably what got in the way of the marriage in the first place. <laughs> yes. And uh I, I know that, you know, for myself, when I was early on in the divorce process and my kids were caught in the middle of all this, it was really difficult because I personally believed in setting boundaries. And my, my daughter, who was the youngest, was really pushing boundaries. And I would set a boundary and she'd call her father and say, Daddy, I don't feel safe pick me up. And mm. I, that would just put a wedge in. So not only was I unable to have any power at all over her, she then went to her father to rescue her and he showed up five minutes later. Mm. And so these are, you know, really destructive ways of, for both parents and for the child, you know, from my, my concern was that my child was going to suffer not I had to be right, but that she needed boundaries. She, she needed some discipline. And the, the interesting thing is that after I, I got help, I mean, I got help to, uh, from a coach who helped me understand my daughter better, helped me really understand their whole dynamic in the relationship. And eventually my kids all came to live with me full time, even though we had joint shared custody, because my daughter said it feels it feels safer here with you. Oh. And the boundaries actually made her feel safer, but it took a long time to sink in. So uh. what I learned from this and, you know, and it's sort of along the same lines um, is I did try to find common ground. I, I couldn't. And I, I learned how to be a better, more consistent parent. And eventually my kids really saw that this was a better way for them to live. Now they all get along with their father really well. And it's very different because they're not young teenage kids. And sometimes when you have really young kids, it can be really scary to have this dynamic. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think you bring up, bring up a wonderful point. And that is oftentimes we, as, as people think that we're alone, think that we're on an island or think that we have to figure everything out ourselves. And so sometimes it's when you can't find that common ground or you've got a, a situation with what I would call a high conflict personality, maybe a narcissist type or, or a borderline personality type, somebody might need to enlist the help of a, a professional, whether that's a, a therapist or somebody else to help understand what's going on, help understand the dynamic, help understand positive things that are within somebody's control and help them understand those things that they'll never be able to control even though they want to. So sometimes getting, getting some outside help is important. Yeah, I mean, definitely you don't have to do any of this alone. People come to you, they come to me, and it's it's just important to get support whenever you're going through a hard time. 
So another thing that happens a lot in contentious divorce is that the children get thrown in the middle. And the, what I just described was, here's my kid and she's saying, dad, come and rescue me. And I know a lot of times people will put the kid in the middle and they'll say, go tell your mother this. I was listening to, I, I don't know if it was a podcast or somebody I knew. I, I feel like I get them all mixed up at this point. But there was a, a kid when he was 12 years old, his parents got divorced and his mother, he lived with his mother and his mother wanted him to go to his father and solve all the problems that they were having. And made him feel like he should be the parent. And he always felt inadequate. Like I can't, I, I'm really angry. I don't want to be put in this position. And he acted out a lot and it was really, really bad. So he finally got help for himself and realized what was going on. But that's just one example of things that parents can do that really is nasty and very harmful to children. So I'd love to hear what you have seen in, in, you know, contentious divorces and how can people protect their children from situations like this? It's more common than I'd like to see it. Um, Unfortunately, children are used as pawns in the game of divorce or relationship struggles. So some of the things that I've seen um, are things like um, a, a mom withholding their child uh, from the dad. Um, you're, you're not going to see, and I'll just call him Billy. You're not going to see Billy because um, you're not doing what it is I need you to do. And that's, that's not fair. That's not fair to the child. It, it's never, never fair to withhold a child from the other parent. The parents should be doing the opposite. They should be doing everything they can to encourage and facilitate an ongoing relationship with that other parent because both parents are so important. And especially young children, they look to each parent as their stability in life. And if if dad's not around as, as much as he used to, they're going to start to wonder about their stability. They might start to become afraid. They might start to become anxious. As you pointed out, they might start uh, acting out. And so keeping that other parent involved like they were, you know, when, when you had an intact marriage is so important. Other things I've, I've seen um, are, are things like you mentioned, where one parent will say, I need you to take this message to your father, or I need you to take this message to your mother. And and children just absolutely should never be used as message carriers. Um, they, They need to be as left out of the divorce process as possible. And about the only thing I believe should be communicated to a a minor child, depending upon their age and their maturity, is that mom and dad are having some struggles and it has nothing to do with you. And we're gonna work it out. And I want you to to know that you're gonna be okay, that you're loved by both of us. And so that's that's super important. Um, And so the opposite of that is, is something unfortunately I've seen. And that is when one or both parents are talking negatively about the other parent, like your mother doesn't love you anymore, or your dad isn't calling you because he doesn't love you anymore. And that is just so incredibly destructive. And I just, I can't imagine uh, people doing that to their children. Unfortunately, they do. Um, Other things I've seen uh, are um, mom and dad or mom and mom, dad and dad, whatever the situation, will get together for an event, let's say a, a child's birthday party. And instead of placing the child first and making sh- sure he or she has a great experience and a great birthday party and sees both parents there in a loving way, um, one of the parents decides to use the opportunity as um, their soapbox and they, they corner the other one or they get them in a, in a room and they decide to, to vomit, for lack of a better word, all of their complaints, all of their feelings, all their struggles. That's just not the appropriate time. And if, if the child overhears or sees, which they're likely to, um, they're going to start to wonder and they're going to start to feel like, what did I do? This was, this was my fault. I'm not 
I'm not loved anymore. And it's just, it's just not fair. So what can parents do to protect their child? Well, I always like to focus on what's within a person's control. And oftentimes we just simply can't control that other person, that other parent. So within each of our control is to not not share anything with the child that they don't need to hear. They don't need to hear that, that mom or dad was served today with divorce papers. They don't, they don't need to hear that. Um, they don't need to hear that uh, mom or dad filed a motion uh, wanting to uh, reduce the amount of child support that the other one is asked. They just, they just don't need to know. They, they, they don't need to hear that. So just within your control, don't get them involved. That's such good advice. You're reminding me of my own parents' divorce. When I was getting married, they were going through the the hell of their divorce and they couldn't be in the same room together. And I talk about boundaries. I learned boundaries right through the divorce process. And then after when I was married and my father started calling me and telling me how horrible my mother was. And I said, I'm going to hang up. If you continue this conversation, it is not appropriate to be telling your daughter things about her mother. Good for you. Click. (laughs) And then (laughs) he'd get angry and call me back. Yeah, it was a process because he had no boundaries. He had no idea that what he was doing was not okay. And they could not be in the same room together for a very long time. And then that becomes a burden on the children and it's not their responsibility. So when I got divorced, I knew I wanted to do a better job with my kids. And I actually taught my kids boundaries. I, they were coming to me with some complaints in the beginning that they weren't happy with certain things their father was doing. And I said, would you like to learn how to deal with that differently? You know, would you like to learn how to set some boundaries with your father? Would you li- like to learn how to speak up and, and say how it feels to you? And I don't know that all parents know how to do that, but I think it's really important to empower the kids to say, don't tell me this, you know, and I remember my kids saying, you know, even to me, like, I don't want to hear anything about dad. I don't want to hear it. This is not, a, this is not appropriate for me. So mm-hmm. they learned really well. And I don't think it's, Kids are really, you could do this with very young children, you know, um, to empower them to have that language. Yes, I think that that giving giving children a voice in the process to be able to express their feelings, express their frustrations is so important. Um, And having those boundaries about things that you as a parent want to hear and don't want to hear, that gives them some structure that gives them some rules to be able to follow so they're not confused. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my clients are divorced and dating and really struggling with how an ex deals with their new significant other. This is another issue that comes into play. Bringing the significant other into their lives without any preparation, uh, bringing the significant other to an event, like a kid's recital performance and then suddenly this person is here and there has been no warning and no gently easing the person into the process and so yeah I I remember my son started reading articles to learn about how parents should be in a divorce (laughs) and he (laughs) he was like Dad, read this. This is how you introduce your girlfriend to us. (laughs) (laughs) Good for him. (laughs) Uh, It's all new for us, though. I mean, you know, I, I, I get it. I get why there's so much confusion and there's so much pain and and unresolved emotions that really need to get worked out. And most people are pretty bad at all of that stuff. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices, your smartphone, your tablet, your PC or Mac, Fire TV, and any Alexa-enabled devices like the Amazon Echo. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days 
just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. When people don't see eye to eye in a lot of things, and we talked a little bit about this, but how can they communicate better with an ex who really has a completely different point of view? Okay. So I believe in celebrating differences because if the world, if everybody in the world was the same, I think this would be an incredibly boring place. (laughs) And I think that we can all coexist with each other with different perspectives, different opinions, different points of view. And I think one massive step that people can take to um, minimize conflict when differences arise is to number one, what I would call check your assumptions at the door. Many of us approach a conflict or a conversation, maybe a difficult conversation with somebody else with a whole list of assumptions. You know, we assume that somebody said what they said because blank, or somebody did what they did because I'm not, I'm not lovable, or I'm not a good person. And sometimes we're right. Oftentimes we're wrong. I say, assume that you're wrong and go into a conversation with somebody wanting to learn information to help you understand better where they're coming from. And so it's, it, I go back to have a learning conversation. So many of us, when we get in conflict with somebody over differences, we really want to make our point. We, we really want to communicate our message and justify why it is we believe what we believe or, or why it is we did what we did. And it's just so important for us to get it out. And I say, put up the roadblock on that and instead flip it around. Find out where the other person is coming from. Because doing that simple act, number one, communicates to that other person, I care about you enough to give you time and space and my attention to listen to you sincerely. So you put your cell phone away, you put it on mute, you don't, you don't listen to them with you know, a magazine in front of you or a piece of paper, you sit down with them and you have eye contact and you're, you communicate to them, you're important to me. I'm here to listen, you have my attention. And if you can also communicate to them that you respect them for sitting down with you and having a conversation with you because that's incredibly vulnerable. And so acknowledging their their willingness to be vulnerable with you is huge, absolutely huge. And we have so many people today like Brene Brown and others talking about empathy and other things. And empathy is massive, absolutely massive. And I wish we did a better job of teaching our young people in school about communication, interpersonal communication and empathy, because by simply Acknowledging what somebody else says in your own words communicates to them, I heard you and I understand what it is you're communicating to me. And you don't, you don't have to agree with it. You don't have to feel the same way. It's simply saying, I heard what you said and that matters. I love this approach. I think that especially if we go in defensive and again, right or wrong thinking, there's no middle ground. You know, the only Mm -hmm. way this, this conversation can go is if you agree with me and otherwise it's going to continue the fight. And when you can find common ground and we all have common values. I mean, I, Mm -hmm. I used to say during my marriage that we had gone into the marriage with common values. We wanted to raise our kids with the same values we just had a different way of doing it. And we completely disagreed on how. And so, you know, and I see it even with people who are married and who, who want to hypermanage the partner. Let's say the mom has, the husband goes out with the kids and he didn't pack the diaper bag the right way. And, and he hasn't clicked all the boxes that she would check. And right. now he's wrong and he's criticized and he doesn't really want to do this anymore because he can't mm-hmm. do it right. right. And so this, the whole appreciation piece is also so critical of just 
being open to having a conversation, to sitting and focusing and to reflecting and hearing. And again, not agreeing just because you're in the same room talking about this together and you don't see eye to eye doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily resolve this and be on the same page, but have more understanding for, for where you're coming from. It creates connection instead of distance. Right, right. And so so often I, I hear things or I see things um, that are communicated to, to the other person like, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, that's a very quick way to shut somebody off. If they had a light switch, you just you just flipped it from on to off. And and other judgments like that, or you're stupid, you don't know what you're talking about. Or, um, you know, God forbid, in, in this day and age, you know, you're just a woman, what do you know? Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, and, and unfortunately, I hear that and I see that a lot. And, and one of the ways I, I coach or counsel my clients um, to, to communicate uh, in conflict, whether it's with their spouse or somebody else, is leave the judgments out of it. Leave the conclusions out of it. It, it doesn't advance whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. And be as brief as possible, be as informative as possible, be friendly. And you mentioned boundaries earlier, be, be firm in your communication. Don't be wishy-washy or, or ambiguous. And so I think that that's another tip. If, if people could leave judgments and conclusions out of these difficult conversations, it will help each person stay engaged and not yeah. shut off. It's so easy to say and <laughs> assumptions, man, I can't even, <laughs> I, the, that's, it's such a killer, the assumption mm. piece and to come yes. in with curiosity instead of judgment yes. and to have empathy first yes. is incredible. And by the way, my ex-husband, as we were divorcing, finally went to get support for himself and became an expert in empathy. And wow. he even created an empathy labyrinth, which was this, it was based on the work of Marshall Rosenberg, the nonviolent communication. Okay. And he, he's a very visual person. And so he created this large piece of canvas that has feelings and needs. And when you're working through something difficult, he has people walk the labyrinth and find the feelings and find the needs that were not met. And uh, he's done incredible work with people, and this is now his <laughs> his business. So, <laughs> wow! Yeah, you never Isn't know. Life interesting. <laughs> it is quite interesting. I love that he does this work, and it's it's helped not only our relationship but his relationship with his children, and it's given him a whole new layer of self growth and and personal development, which has been incredible. That's wonderful. So let's talk about something that also happens a lot is, is those nasty text messages and emails, especially when you're dealing with an abusive ex. I've had ex, I've had clients who have had, I would say, you know, on the narcissistic abuse spectrum, even though it's not my, you know, I can't diagnose people, but really it's all about them and the demands and not showing up when they're supposed to and um, not paying what they're supposed to and just really ugly, ugly texts and emails. And so what would you suggest? If somebody is um, not coming from a place of internal, what I would call internal power or internal strength, then that person needs to do everything that they can, whether it's working with a, a coach or a, a licensed mental uh, a professional, mental health professional, do something to find your inner strength so that these, these little jabs um, don't, you can minimize the impact to you. You, you, you become more strong in yourself. You are coming from a, a place of, of strength. And you know that these messages that you're receiving have more to do with the sender of the message than they do with you. So that would be, that would be step number one. Um, if, if for whatever reason funds aren't available for that or there isn't time for that, then I would say <clears throat> the worst thing that you could do when you get text messages 
uh, nasty text messages is to respond in kind because that's just that's that, that's throwing more fuel on the fire and it's not doing anybody any good so the next worst thing not not so worse it's definitely a strategy is to ignore it simply don't respond and if you want to respond you could send a message like <clears throat> i refuse to allow you to communicate with me that way I'm happy to communicate with you in a civil way. And when you can find the ability to do that, I'm happy to receive your text messages. It's very brief. It's very clear. You're holding to a boundary. You're telling them what you will accept and what you won't. And now the ball's in their court. Either they're going to do it or not. Um, the next thing is if, if, if it's something that you need to respond to, so let's say it's a long text message and it's got nasty jabs throughout, uh, lots of judgments, name calling, what have you, but there are some things in there maybe about the kids that you have to respond to. Only respond where you need to respond. So if there's a question about, um, let's say, homework, respond to that as briefly as possible with as much information as you think that person needs to answer their question. Be friendly about it. You know, don't say, you stupid idiot, if you paid attention to your, to your son's um, uh, homework, then you would know exactly what he needs to do. You, you, don't, you don't need to do that. It's not going, it's not going to advance um, your, your goals. So just respond briefly with in, good information, be as friendly as possible, and then be very firm. You know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, a, a kumbaya type of message. It doesn't have to, to end with, you know, um, uh, flowers, you know, type of gif or something like that. Just be friendly and, and firm. And so I think that especially with high conflict personalities, like narcissist types, borderline types, histrionic types, it's so important to limit your communication because with all of those types they will go off of something that you said or didn't say or something that you do or don't do so don't give them fuel for their fire just just keep it keep it limited really good advice i i have also told my clients to um there's a term in therapy called gray rock you probably have heard of this where you act like you're a gray rock in that ignoring place, because mm. I think it's, it's hard to just ignore all the bad stuff. It's, it's like, you know, sticks and stones names do hurt. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> but knowing where they come from, knowing that it's more about them, which are all good points and not reacting. It's, it's so important not to be reactive and defensive those are two things that I think you've repeated several times in this conversation that, you know, to have a peaceful communication, we really need to look for how we connect, just focus on the good, ignore the bad stuff, don't put your kids in the middle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and really, I think the more people don't give fuel to or don't give energy to the stuff that's toxic, the more it just starts to go away because it doesn't have the fuel that keeps it ignited. Very so, true. Yeah. I mean, this is really good advice. I, you wanted to say one more thing? Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add a little bit um, based upon what you just said. And, and that is um, we can, uh, uh, other people talk about this, modeling behavior for others. And it works. You know, if, if, you've, if you've read or, or studied anything about social contagion, you know, if, if, we, if we sit across the table from somebody who is irate and we remain calm, there is some possibility that they will calm down. However, if we react in kind and get upset and pound the table and yell and scream, they're likely to continue. So what you said about it, it's so hard to be, um, you know, if you're a science fiction pan, fan um, and you like Star Trek, Spock, you know, be like Spock, non-emotional. Um, it's incredibly difficult to, to be that way because we really are emotional beings that happen to think logically and can analyze things as opposed to logical analytical beings that happen to have emotions. And so oftentimes our decisions, our reactions are based in emotion. And so it really takes some mindfulness 
to be able to recognize when somebody does something or says something, how is it triggering you? So you recognize that. What's happening to my body? My heartbeat is increasing. I'm starting to get warm. I'm starting to sweat. Okay, what do I typically do in situations like this? Well, I run away and I yell. Okay, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to smile and I'm just going to let them have their voice. You know, it's, it's, it's that kind of a process. And, and the more that people practice it, I think the easier it becomes. Absolutely. And I love that you brought the body in because I think most of us ignore the sensations in our body, which are the preclude to the emotions. Mm. And if we can not only pay attention to those emotions, but we can actually magnify those feelings, like what's happening for me, instead of being focused on the other person, what that person's doing to you, we have so much more control over our feelings and over the words that come out of our mouths than I think most of us give ourselves credit for. But, but most of us don't learn these things. We don't know because we've not been taught, which right. is why this is such a passion of mine and a passion of yours to really help people to be more mindful, to know we have options, to empower people to have a, a more peaceful resolution, even when there is high conflict. Very true. Yeah. So I know this is really about high conflict divorced and, and communication with an ex, but you know, a, a lot of the divorce knowledge that we gain really can inform us for the dating that we do after divorce. And so I'm wondering if you have any words of advice for people who want to go on their last first date after a divorce. Oh, I love that question. And I certainly do. So my advice would be number one, know yourself, know what your values are, know what your beliefs are, know what you want out of life, and then try and find somebody that fits with your values, with your beliefs. And then part two would be, when you're on this date, ask yourself this question, can I accept this person exactly how they are? Or is there something I need to change in order for them to be okay for me? And if there's something that you desperately need to change in order for them to be okay, it's not going to be your last first date. <laughs> <laughs> Very wise. <laughs> and I think that everybody that I know has gone in thinking that person would be great if only. Ah. And it's that, that if only thinking is so toxic um, <laughs> yes. because it's not fair to the other person or to you, right? right? We, we, you know, and I think just to clarify, because I think people think, well, there's no perfect. Mm. It's not about perfect. It's right. about what you said in number one, which is know who you are, know what you value, know what your beliefs are and what you want out of life. And if that person aligns then the way they chew is not going <laughs> to really be that important, right? You can let right. go of the habits, but not the values. Right. Yeah. Well said. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I wish I knew that before I got married. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> is this your second marriage? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I recently have had some dating experiences where one person was way too slow and showing emotion and physical touch. All of it was just, it was like not going anywhere. So it was mm. like, then I met somebody who was like, bam, you know, I want to touch you. <laughs> You're amazing. Let's plan a future together. And my friend was joking with me and she said, You're like Goldilocks. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you've got the one who's not too hot and the one who's too cold and you're looking for the one who's just right. And I think, <laughs> right. <laughs> I think that, you know, it's, it is about not perfection, but really compliment and find the person who aligns, who you really respect and admire who they are today, not who they once were, who they might become. Right. I had a, a guy I dated once who said, well, I used to be in really great shape. I was a really good athlete. I'm like, that's great, but you don't get any exercise now. Like you do nothing. So kind of irrelevant, but that's nice that you were part of a, a softball league. 
great. <laughs> <laughs> right. What do you what do you do with that? You know, there's a there's a real quick, there's a great saying I love, and that is don't let perfect be the enemy of good or great. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> And it for ourselves too. I mean, I think people have such high standards that they don't produce, you know, which brings me back to what I said in the beginning of this conversation, which is dare to think big. So many people don't release that book or whatever that big dream is because it's not perfect. And yes, yeah, then it's nobody can see it. And nobody will ever know. That's right. That's right. I love, I love dream big. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this has just been a fabulous conversation, AJ. Let let our audience know the best way to find you. If you can share one or two links with us, and it'll all be in the show notes as well. Sure. So the link to my website is www.leapfrogdivorce.com. And why leapfrog? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, what I did was uh, I took a sheet of paper. And I brainstormed enough ideas to fill up both sides. And I handed it to my wife and I said, pun intended, pick out the one that leaps out to you first. And she picked Leapfrog. And the way that name got on this this list was um, when I was younger, I was fascinated with frogs. So I had a frog piggy bank and I had frog Christmas tree ornaments and I had uh, frog uh, stuffed animals. And so it was just something that brought me a lot of joy when I was younger. And uh, when I was thinking up a name, I thought, I don't want to be like everybody else in my in my marketplace. I don't want to be the the Smith Jones and Jones law firm, or I don't want to be the the Florida divorce firm or the, or the men's divorce firm. I wanted something catchy because because when I when I think about myself as as a creative uh, visionary type person, I want something to reflect that, and so that's what I went with. I love it. That's great. Well, thank you again for coming on the show and sharing such important information. I am sure my audience is going to learn so many new things today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sandy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thanks everybody for listening. If you love our show, please give us a great review and rating on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate all of those wonderful reviews. It helps more people find us and listen to these great interviews And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. That's lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. I look forward to talking to you soon.